Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. Um, this is Playable Futures in Real Life. Playable Futures, if you've never heard of it before, is a series of articles and pieces and interviews with gaming industry leaders. Um, you can find them all on gameindustry.biz. And if you've missed them, this is the stuff you've missed out on. So you've missed Sir Ian Livingston talking about the future of entertainment and games combining based upon his lengthy industry in gaming. You've missed Stephen Marr from Tencent talking about hyper-digital realities and what that means for the future of gaming. And you've missed Bakola Akinbar talking about the intersection of education and gaming in Nigeria. I say miss them, they're all still on the website, you can go and look at them right now. They're great, they're genuinely great. Um, and it's thanks to Diva, the, the agency that I'm from, Yuki and Sumo Group, that these articles have appeared on Game Industry Beers. So check those out. But that's not why we're here. Here we have got real industry leaders in real life to answer some questions about playable futures. I'm going to ask you each to introduce yourself in about 30 to 60 seconds. We had a warm-up chat and it went on for a bit, so please keep it short. Um, please introduce yourself. Try to be fast. Uh, my name is Agostino Simonetta Agro uh, for everyone. I'm the chief game officer at Thunderful Games, a Swedish-based developer, publisher, investors. My background is indie gaming uh, and joined the company nine months ago from Xbox. I still have no idea what I'm going to say. So my name is Gina Jackson. Uh, I'm a consultant. I do a lot of stuff around uh, mental health, games production, uh, diversity, and particularly education. I'm a big proponent of apprenticeships and how the games industry needs to use apprenticeships more. Hello, I'm John Clark. I'm the CEO of Curve Games, who are a small, independent British publisher. We employ about 70 people. I've been in the industry for 25 years. Uh, before Curve, I joined Curve in December 2020. I was at Tencent as VP of Partnerships for Europe. And before that, I spent about 13 years at Sega Europe. Um, and I worked with Gina at IDOS before that. So. 25 years? Uh, OK, I've worked in the industry 30. No, yeah. I'm not going to go there. Um, Thank you. I forgot. I'm James Watley. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer for Diva, creative agency specialising in games. Nice to meet you. Um, so, today's session, I want to anchor it a little bit in a few themes, if you'll bear with me on this, around when you look at the future of play and playable futures, it's very easy to get drawn into conversations about subscription, about new models, about VR, virtual worlds. What I want to talk to you about today is about leadership and values, and what that means to you. You're all in, you're all different leaders in your own right. What does leadership mean to you in games for 2022 and beyond? Let's start with you, John. I think it's interesting when you say about some of the other talks. Um, whenever I've given a presentation, especially I, get, I gave one on Monday, and there's a line that has probably always been in the presentation, which is technology evolves. Like we're, you know, we're talking about it now at, 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 at WASD, at London Games Festival. Technology evolves. It's always evolved. So there's no surprise in that. So as technology evolves, it, ch it changes the way that we, we interact with developers. It changes the way that we think about marketing and distribution. So therefore, it, it sort of changes the approach of every company. You know, we see now that you know, new companies come into, come into the industry. Um, incumbent companies change and transition the way they work. So for me, the, the leadership throughout all that, I think, I think there are three things, really. One of them is for a leader to have a vision. And that vision is influenced by what's, what's happening in the world around them. So having a vision is really important. The second thing is communicating the vision. And that doesn't happen just once. It's constant communication. It doesn't matter how many times you keep talking about it. It's, you know, what does that vision mean to each team, each individual, the company, the partners? And the third one is providing the environment for all your, all your team and all your employees to be able to contribute to achieving that vision. So I say that those are the three things for me. And would you agree with that, Aga? Yeah, uh, John touched on something that uh, is extremely important. Technology and gaming ecosystems have always changed. Today, as leader in the sector, we are facing the fastest ever evolution that we have ever had. I talked about the Darwinian evolution of the system happening at that speed is incredible. Uh, my background is indie dev, and then I worked at Platform, PlayStation, and Xbox for 12 years, and there's been a lot of evolution, the indie movement, the free-to-play, and platform, but the speed today is way faster than what we were seeing in, uh, before. And the leader is how do you build an environment, a company, that is able to react 
uh, and to be ahead of that curve. And one of the things that in our chat earlier we talked about is building a company that feels that failure is not the end of a career. A failure is a process you go through, and as long as you learn from your failure, uh, it's actually an improvement of the company. I think that's one of the challenges we have because we are all making mistakes all the time in an environment that we don't know where it's going to be in two, three years' time. Uh, if as a leader you don't enable your team to fail every now and then and feel that they won't be punished because of that, then you're going to fail because you become a stale company that doesn't challenge its own business model. That's interesting. So from a, from a pick up on the failure point for a minute, as I understand the technology sector, the learning from failure, failures generally, battle scars, that's a very American way. If you're failing, you're learning. In Europe, I don't feel like that's an actual thing. Failure is seen as failure. Is that the kind of cultural shift you're talking about changing? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, gaming business is a, is a global, and you're right. In, you know, an American is probably more re failure is more rewarded, or it's actually a requirement for a CEOs to be, you know, credible. Uh, it is a challenge, and there we have it in Europe more than than other countries. Uh, you know, our companies spread around the world. We have people from South Africa and South America and Sweden, the headquarter, and uh, so you have all those cultures. But yeah, we, we're in an environment that is so uncertain. If you don't enable failure, that you're never going to challenge your own business model. They're successful today, but might fail tomorrow. You know, the blue, blue ocean, red ocean kind of philosophy, and, you know, Nintendo was so famous when they went and adopted that philosophy and tried with the Wii, the launch of the Wii. I think it's super important for a company to be successful over time through those changes. You've both spoken about leadership, vision setting, context specifically. What I want to understand and what I would like to communicate for the people in the room is the values that underpin that. So all well and good setting a vision, all well and good communicating it, but how do you do that? And if you're looking at the context, and I'm going to bring you in on this, Gina, on the context of the market, the industry, the gender pay gap, all of that around that, that's, that's context. That's context of setting a vision. How do you go about addressing that? You own it. You don't pretend it's not happening. You don't make excuses for it. You absolutely go out there and you own what's going on. I think one of the companies, bizarrely the sponsor, is Sumo, who've owned their gender pay gap. If you just look at their figures, they don't look great. But if you read what they've said and you read what they're doing, you've seen how they're owning it, they're looking at their values, um, and they're working on it. I'm not going to sit here and say they don't need to do more, but you need to understand what you as a leader are going to say. It comes back to the failure thing. They could say they're failing and uh, you know, it's really hard in games and there are no women. But it's not, it's not a failure, we're learning from it, we're moving forward, we're understanding that our audience is more diverse. If we wanna sell more games, we have to include more people. And, and how are we gonna do that? How are we gonna test it? So there's a, there's a lot of stuff. And I think in the past, it's been really easy for people just to, to make the same game, make the game for us. And, and be happy with that. And I think we need to move away from the, even the word failure is really quite tough. It's not as successful as we'd like it to be. So how do we make it more successful? And how do we continue to try, try and make it more successful? Instead of just dumping stuff, you can still learn from it. Um, and you can play around with it. With, for an industry that makes entertainment and play, often we forget to be playful and experimental about the stuff we're doing. And we just do the same thing over and over again, and we become quite, to be honest, quite dull. So, okay, how's this? On doing the same thing over and over and over again, you can't go a month at the moment without reading about workplace toxicity in games. How do you square that off with trying to be better, trying to bring in new talent, trying to feed in the work required to grow the massive acceleration going on in the industry today? How, how are you addressing that as leaders in business? I'm going to put you on the spot, John. Sorry, yeah. Put, put me on the spot. I think, um, you know, working for a small company such as Curve compared to Sega, which is a, you know, a, you know we're a European office of a, of a Japanese, big Japanese corporate. You know, there's one thing that we've been able to do at Curve, it comes back to how Gina opened before, is we, we can own the business. It means that our actions influence what we do and everybody else around us. And we, you know, it feels like a startup at Curve. We've gone through quite a, an interesting transition and, and, you know, really, really sort of strong um, recruitment drive over the last 12 months. 
And we want people to come in not to work for Curve, but to shape Curve, to feel as if they own Curve, and they're responsible for making Curve the company that they want to work for, as opposed to a place to come and do a job. And I think that, that ownership that, that Gina mentioned is, is really, really important. It's also really difficult because, you know, it would have been more difficult to do that at Sega. It would have been way more difficult to do that at Tencent. So, um, you know, providing the environment, we, we can do that at Curve, but we need everybody to do it at Curve who joins. Would you say the lessons you've learned from Microsoft help you do that at Thunderfall? Yeah, I'm more than happy to talk about that. Uh, yeah, I joined Xbox in 2014, and I left just uh, at the end of June last year. And I think Microsoft in general has been on a great journey, uh, great leadership from Phil Spencer in the gaming, uh, and Sachin and Adela. And fair to say, when I joined, my leadership team and the chain was great people, and they looked very different from the chain of command when I left. And he, uh, the, the great thing about working in such a big corporate environment where you learn uh, you know, the resources they have and the opportunity they, they give you to learn. And I think it's something that we brought uh, over to, um, to Thunderful when I joined. And, uh, and I think value, so we have our mission and our vision. Uh, the, we just published the yearly report, so because we are a listed company, so it's all public what our values are and our vision. And for us, is diversity is the first one, uh, inclusiveness, sustainability, and then two other, oh, oh, points of what we call our North Star is we want to be commercially successful and we want to be properly organized. But what I said to the team recently is that the first three are the most important. And there are two angles to look at those values. Is one, there is the moral aspect, the human rights aspect, which should be the, for everyone the number one criteria, right? We need to be diverse because it's the right thing to do. And you want to be inclusive because it's the right thing to do. And sustainability for the environment or for, uh, for the employees or is important. But also we can, and then in the other angle is the commercial. You know, somebody asked me, well, what would your board or shareholders think about it? If people don't believe in it from a moral point of view, they need to believe in it because company cannot be successful long term in an evolving ecosystem without doing those things. The landscape out there of people playing our games is not what it used to be 20 years ago. And I said to the team that we cannot be commercially successful, and we cannot be properly organized if we don't do the first three. And final, we control those three. As a leader in the company, as a team, we own it. We, we can build a diverse company. We can build an inclusive and sustainable company. Commercial success sometimes is out of our control. We might do all the right things, and the ecosystem changes. We make the wrong calls. And, Properly organized, sometimes you think you're doing the wrong thing and the complexity comes in, but the first three are the things we cannot fail on. Because we control it, uh, we can influence it. Uh, our board is uh, supportive of, of this, and if I fail as a leader, I feel really bad if I fail on the first three. The other two, I'm happy to accept that. It's fine, but the, the first three, it's in our control. So I want to, I'm going to come back to you on that for a second, but I just want to open this out. So from a, from, on the commercial point, we were discussing this earlier on, there was a McKinsey report in 2018 which said, if you have gender diversity at the top, you're 21% more likely to improve profitability. And if you have ethnic and cultural diversity at the top, that increases to 33%. That's insane. Just by implying and, imp and Im implementing diversity, gender, culturally, yes, you've got four white people on the stage telling you this, um, that's painfully aware, but it can have that kind of difference on your bottom line. On coming back to being diverse, it's all well and good sticking it as a label on the wall. How are you applying that day to day? Are you putting it, for example, in people's annual reviews? It's funny, you seem like one of my board members. Uh, Cecilia from the, the board, when I presented this vision, was like, that's all nice and good, but what does it mean? And, I only joined nine months ago, but the idea, those values are meaningless if no part of the lived experience uh, and the team every day. Uh, starting from HR processes, in hiring people, how are those actually implemented in your hiring process, in the, your review process, in the way you present the games, in the games you create. So effectively, it's a clear understanding of all from the team, and I have somebody at the back there that can, uh, can confirm or deny, but they need to be part of your day-to-day, -day, your goal, your tasks. Uh, you know, your success as an individual is, I delivered my deal, I delivered on time, but if I'd done it in 
in a way they excluded the people around me. There's no being respectable of this value. You still have fail, and as a leader, I fail. So they need to be open, part of your operation day to day. It's not just a value you aspire to. They need to be implemented in everything the company does. Your experience of consulting with many different companies, how does this kind of leadership sound to you? New, rare, amazing, embrace something to embrace? It sounds quite common these days. Right. I think we probably 70% of companies get it and want to do something about it. And there's probably 30% of companies who are fine the way they are because it's working for them today. But as we hit this skills crisis we're in, we, you know, if you look at Games Jobs Live, there are 2,759 jobs live today, and only 167 of them are for junior roles and 60% of them have been live for more than a month. So anyone in any company can get up and go somewhere else. And for that commercial reason, I think companies, the 30% who weren't keen on it before, are suddenly going to get keen on it, because if they want to keep their talent, they need to create an environment that people thrive and want to be part of. And you know, as more of those toxic stories come out, people are going, well, hang on, do I want to be part of this? Or if there's not a leader at that organization taking responsibility and changing that, then, then people will just leave because they can today. And in a way, that makes my heart sing because we'll finally show that this industry can be diverse and supportive and brilliant. On that supportive point, it's interesting. I was reading a lot about, um, well, these days the focus on mental health as well as physical health. And when you read about games, you read about crunch. I don't know how you can square it off that crunch is a thing when we are supposed to be caring about people's mental health, and let's be honest, physical health while they're crunching. How, how are you applying rules around crunch in your businesses? Can I just add one comment, maybe to get you out? <laughs> I was working with, when I was at Safe in Our World, the mental health charity, we were working and doing some research about how consumers feel about companies who make their employees crunch. And we expected people to say, yeah, yeah, that's awful, but we'd still buy the game. But actually, from the research we were able to develop, consumers said, actually, if they really understood what people were going through, they probably wouldn't buy the game. Now, that research never came out, and I'd love to see that research done properly. But again, back to that commercial thing, if you go back to companies and go, actually, if you push people to crunch and people get to know that, that's going to impact the commercial stuff of your game, I think we've got a better chance of eradicating it. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good point. I think from our point of view, I think there's a, there's a couple of things. One, we're a small team. Two, we're a very fresh team, and we're a transitioning company, and we're trying to sign a lot of games, and we're trying to ship a lot of games. We're working with about 26, 27 different publishers, uh, sorry, developers, all with different technical capabilities from 11 different countries, different creative capabilities, different characters, different timelines, different milestones. So within that, sort of, it creates a, an incredible variety of pressure points. And it's not just about coming together as teams to work with the developers. It's coming together to work with each other and understand if we belong at the company. Because if you know, we've hired 50 people in about 15 months, that's 50 people that have started a new job. That's 50 people that have left an old job where maybe they felt really, really comfortable. I mean, I spent 13 years at Sega. I know what it was like to go to a new company. It's stressful, regard regardless of whether or not you think you're doing a good job, regardless of how busy you are. So, so really, I think there's the recognition that, that people work hard, a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress is caused, and a lot of impact on, on, on mental health. Now, that doesn't solve it. Just to be able to talk about it, it doesn't take it away. You can't just have a, competition, a conversation and just, just take everything away. So it's, it's an ongoing process. And I think, you know, for me, it's just continually talk, continually educate yourselves, you know, show progress in those areas. Progress is one of our values. And, and that relates to a lot of things. And one of them is our understanding of each other, our understanding of how, how the world changes. And, you know, well-being and, and, and mental health seems like quite a new thing, right? You know, we're talking about it way more, way more than we ever did. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an illness that people can't necessarily relate to because they can't see it. So it makes it really difficult. So we just need to keep talking. Interestingly, someone said to me once, 
And this is, probably isn't going to help anything. Someone said to me once, and it was about a particular working environment, not one that I'm in now, one that I was in uh, quite a while ago. So they said, no, no one is going to come up to you and say, work less. Right? No one's going to walk up to you and say, I can see that you're, you, know, you worked 15 hours yesterday. Can you work eight tomorrow? That's not going to happen. And I think it could happen at Curve. I want to make sure I can create the environment where we can say to our line manager, we can say to ourselves, it's actually okay for me to switch off now. And we know that there's work that needs to be done. We know there's a deadline that needs to be met. But as long as we can provide the platform co for communication, and we're not there, um, hopefully we'll be able to work together. That's another one of our values. Um, to get through it. Yeah. What about you, Ago? I... A couple of weeks ago at GDC, I gave a talk about something completely different about pitching. And one other comment I made, I left development because of crunch. So I love development. I started as an India, worked on FIFA and a lot of other products. And I left development. One of the reasons was crunch. It was no longer sustainable to have a normal life. Uh, so it's something that has got better over the years. Finally, when we talk about crunch, we talk about in a negative way, when probably some of us in the early days of our careers were in crunch. It was actually lifestyle. Uh, we were all younger and, uh, you know, very different situation. And kind of people accepted it. It was a given. Uh, and it wasn't tolerated. It was normal. That's what you do. You do crunch. And, you know, people my age are still, oh, you know, I didn't sleep for one night. We did 48 hours without sleeping, and then we crashed. And, now, finally, we are in a situation where it's negative, not just for the people in the industry, but then the gamers are looking at it from a negative point of view. I think with the evolution, when we talk about diversity and you know, inclusiveness or crunch, we are on the right trajectory. Whether the right speed of evolution, then is arguably, and it changes from company to company. But finally, we are on the right trajectory. So crunch is not something that's acceptable. And studies are out there that should actually crunch doesn't help anyone. The final product doesn't, it's not better. You don't ship on time, you, you lose candidate. So I think finally the conversation is, has the right turn to it. It's a negative and it's accepted. It worked for some companies. We know that there are a lot of companies that are there that believe that crunch and I don't know how sustainable it is when, Gina, you're right. Today, especially companies like Curve or Thunderful Games, you know, we're at least a company a bit bigger than Curve, but we are not the giants. We can't always compete on monies or the size of the project, you're also competing in values and the, the lifestyle and the, the way people feel about your company. So that is going to help the evolution. But let's not kid ourselves. I had a conversation with somebody, the LGF launch on Friday, and, and I'd not seen her for a long time, but I'd followed her career and she's doing amazing things. And I said, oh, since I last saw you, I had a baby, I've got a four-year-old. And, and she said, oh, that's amazing. And I said, look, don't, don't kid yourself, it's really hard. Um, <laughs> it's really hard at 48, really hard. But she looked at me and she said, I, I'm not sure I want to have children because both of us work in the games industry and we both crunch and I don't think we could do it. That, to me, was just a heartbreaking story. It, she works in an industry where she's asked to put her career before her family life. And she's thinking that already in her, in her mid-twenties, still today. We're still, and there are plenty of companies where that's still the choice you're making. Yeah. The positive thing is that there are companies that now have to compete in the space. If they don't do it because it's right, they have to compete. And then we just changed some of our policies actually to make that decision easier for people. Uh, then people like us, they're smaller, we are competing in that space. People that are bigger, you know, come from Microsoft where the policies were amazing. So there are a lot of companies that there's enough competition that people like your friends have an option to not change career. A lot of my fellow developers from 17 years ago are no longer in gaming. Your friends have an option to go company like Curve or us or many other companies where it is possible to do that. Not all the companies are like that. None of us are perfect, but there is an opportunity now. Mm. And but it was the fact that she couldn't see it, and she works for a very, very large company. But it, it's the mindset that we have to change. We have to keep those conversations going. We have to say, look at what these companies are doing. And interestingly, just to say that, you know, some of the bigger companies are also some of the companies that have got some of the best handbooks that they give out in terms of supporting well-being and diversity as well. 
that's interesting. Yeah. We don't have a very good handbook. We're only small. We haven't made it yet. But so, those two companies that her and her partner work for are both publicly listed companies. Being publicly listed doesn't make you any better. It's just, no, no, it just no, makes your quarterly results more visible. Uh, and, you know, it's important that you do it and not relying just on the reaction of your in investors or your board, uh, whether they like it or not. You need to do it because you believe in it, because sometimes some of your shareholders might don't mind or they might not looking into it. You really need to do it because you believe it. Being listed it just makes scrutiny easier, generally it's on the financials or when there is a scandal. So I don't think we are any better as a listed company than Curve is because it's private. It's the leadership team needs to believe it. And I think as a leader, you need to put your neck on the line and do sometimes things that will make your life a bit more difficult or time consuming. You know, the team knows that there is any problem, uh, they can always come directly to me. If there is anything going on in the company, if they want to change the company, they, they, for me it's important they know that if they have ideas, they don't like something, they want to change something, they, they want to improve what we do, you have that open line of communication and it's on your neck. I think, Eugenia or John, you talk about owning it. Yeah. But I would say we need to encourage people to, when they're looking at a job, not look at the job or just the job. They need to look at the leadership. They need to look at the organization. And, and that's very difficult for an industry where people are so passion-led. Yeah. They're just looking what's in front of them. I'm going to work on this game. It's going to be amazing. I'm going to be doing this. This is a step forward. Yeah. We need to step back and support people to look at the whole thing. We've got 200, you said 2,759 mm. open jobs? Yep. Women choosing not to have families, a gender pay gap 10% higher than the national average, and toxic workplaces everywhere. We've got a, an image problem. How do we solve that? We all go quiet. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, but, I, mean, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm sat yeah. on this stage with good company. Okay? Yeah. And that, that's one of our values, by the way, at David, yeah. good company being good people, making sure that you're setting the right standards. Great leaders yep. are defined by the leaders they make behind them. Yep. And so to your point, when they're coming in and looking at mm. a company and saying, oh, look at that leadership, look at their values, mm -hmm. look at you know, the reviews that they're getting from ex-employees, yes, but as a sector, mm. as an industry, those stories are few and far between. Yeah, I'll go for it. I mean, let's, let's look at the vacancies firstly. I mean, that, that's, you know, that just shows we've got a vibrant industry. I think that's yeah. it. We've had two, two years of the, you know, I think last year, Global industry work 100, worth $175 billion. The year before, worth $175 billion. They're the two biggest years in video games. In 2023, it's forecast to go through $200 billion. So that's incredible. Right now, for one reason or another, finding people is difficult. There's a skills gap. There's a skills shortage. The consumption of content, particularly throughout the pandemic, has, has, is at an all-time high. And therefore... You know, there are lots of studios and businesses that are being acquired. You know, we've just seen the, the biggest acquisition in the games industry of $68 billion, where Activision were bought by Microsoft. This is all for talent. It's all for content. So, you know, people are paying well. So there is a big hoovering up of the talent. Now, for us, the same as for Argo, hiring people is really difficult. There are more jobs than people. Now, why, why is that? Are we getting enough people into the industry? We're not seeing, certainly throughout the pandemic, it's really difficult for new people to come to the games industry because they, they can't relate to it. They don't know where it exists. So how do we build the environment to bring people into the games industry? So we've noticed that. And then when you hire more senior people, you're hiring people that have been in the industry for 25 years. And we all know who they are and what they look like. And, and, you know, and they've all got to change as well. But, you know, the, the skills gap is real. Available talent is real. Companies you know, getting big injections of cash to hire more people is real. Now, when you... So that, that needs to be solved through, through education, through Brexit and the free movement of people. Um, th those are two difficult things. And then the next thing is the gender pay gap. I, would, I, don't, I won't claim to be an expert in this, but I remember at a company I was at before, the gender pay gap was gen generally caused not by, not by the same job, you know, being valued any differently, whether you're male or female, but the fact that there were more senior males yeah. than there were females, and that's what, what drove it. And we're, we're going to be the same, because I know that from, you know, from, from our sort of, you know, gen, gender balance, I think, we're, I think we're, we're, we're not at the average. We are, we are 72 
28. I checked. So we're not at the average, so we know we've got work to do. Um, but because of that, we'll have the same average at, at a senior level as well. So we have got more higher paid jobs taken by men than by women. And I think that's something that we need to support. We need to encourage and provide the platform, not only to recruit um, in the right way, but to also develop people as well. So th those are the two things I think you mentioned, three things. Those are the two things that I'd address. I see skills and movement of staff as something, you know, in the fact that the acquisitions are, are taking a lot of available um, skills and talent. And then the gender, gender pay gap caused by being able to develop and provide career paths for, for women in particular to reach more senior, senior level jobs as well. So just to throw something out there, um, maybe we could encourage career changes to come into the games industry. I've just done a boot camp to help career changes um, that maybe don't have degrees, who've been working very successfully in other sectors, who we can help transition across to the games industry. But actually, most companies aren't open to that. You go and talk to them, and they say, yes, we've got a skills problem, and yes, we'd like to hire some people. And then you look at their job ads. Well, you want to be a producer. Well, you've got to work on at least one title from start to finish. OK, but, but how can you do that? You don't want people who've got really good project management skills or really understand technology or no, no, you just want this. Oh, have they worked in QA? They're brilliant. They're coming through. And I'm not saying that people who work in QA aren't brilliant producers. They are. But if you've got six producers, let's have a couple of QA. Let's bring in some who've worked in totally different sectors, who bring different skill sets. And employers say they want it. But then when you turn up, as I did, with a whole bunch of boot campers who've, who've spent six weeks working on live projects, have been exposed to 40 industry experts who are ready to go, People say, oh, yeah, but they've not had five years. But a couple of companies I worked with did, one of them being Secret Mode, who took somebody on who came from Marketing Insights. She's amazing. Um, you know, she's worked with Costa Coffee, Virgin. She's worked with these big brands. She's offering something new. So I think we've got a skills crisis. We've got a great way to diversify our um, employees by bringing in these new talents to help with our leadership. But with totally close to it because we want degrees we want the same people we've always had i really we like need that to idea break that mid funnel talent swap that's really nice and being open to bring people from different background i'm not going to name names but every month i do an intro call with new employees and uh, there was a new employee that uh, joined us completely from a different background so tv and production and suddenly she joins the call and introduces herself. I didn't know her, didn't know her background. And suddenly, as a, comp as a Thunderful, we're a big company, we also have an animation studio. And suddenly, this lady is like, well, that's my background. I know a lot about that. And suddenly, like, hold on a second. This is why we need to bring in people from different backgrounds, because suddenly our needs are different, because we evolve a company. Suddenly, you know more about that than me, who actually need to decide what we're going to do with that part of the business. And you bring fresh ideas and different point of views. We have a very, very senior production role a person that come from a completely different industry, project management skills, knew very little about games in terms of production, never been in production. Outstanding. And then you start off bringing new ideas. Small companies, as we are, maybe sometimes you have this tendency of hiring. You have less money than the big companies. You don't have the processes. You don't have the setup. You hire people you know. And let's face it, people we might know, they tend to be kind of like us. They've been on this journey for over 20 years. Uh, and you know, you're not really bringing new ideas. They might be super good, but quite often you're bringing stale ideas. And instead, if you're open-minded and you bring in people with the talent and they're clever, they might not know exactly that function, but they can learn it very quickly. That is super positive. And that's another way to diversify the company. If you're looking for developers in the same pool, the people that have been around for 20 years, chances are, because of the history of the industry, you know, 90% of the engineers will be male. Or you know, in the PR, 80% of the PR might be female. You, know, you need to broaden that horizon. Otherwise, you're stuck in that pool. And uh, university is doing better for a few years. I was teaching in a university in Spain. And uh, year after year, we had more female candidates. Year, the first year was like a couple. And then the year after, actually, some of friends of friends told the friends, oh, you know, it's a viable career. And, and it, it changes. 
It's a journey. Nobody has, a, yeah, nobody has the answer. If any of the three of us had the answer and the solution, we maybe wouldn't be here. We would probably you know, be in a different role. But we are on the right path. We are making mistakes and making, doing something things right. But I'm generally positive about the direction uh, of where we're going. You know, if we compare notes, maybe not on a stage, about how the <laughs> industry was 20 years ago and where we are today, we are not perfect. But in 20 years, the change has been incredible. I'm a lot less patient than I go. I think this is an opportunity and we need to grab it. Maybe because I've had a different experience. Yeah. Um, but I love this industry and I love what we do. And now here's an opportunity to bring other people in to change the way we're thinking of it. And we're like, mm, I'm not really sure. Mm, do I? Do, oh, it's a bit of a risk. Well, not having anyone's a bit of a risk. Yeah. Government are giving us loads of money to support apprenticeships. Yeah, but who wrote them and are they really for me and I'll have to fill out some paperwork? You know, th people are bending over backwards to help us and, and often we don't see it and we're really insular in our thinking. And it's how do we break out of this? You know, you're two amazing leaders. How do we break out of it? Thank we you. need to well, shake it out. Will you answer that one second? We're into the final furlong, so we've got about five minutes left. If anybody's got any burning questions, start thinking about raising your hand up. If you've not got the courage to raise your hand up, take the next five minutes to build the courage. Because when this finishes, I'm going to open it out to questions. Cool? We cool? OK, cool. Um, no, two things. One, just a statement. Our new head of people in culture is brand new to the industry, and she's amazing, so that's good. Um, the second one is, I guess it's, it's, it's a question for me as well, is how do we feel that the actual content that we handle, does that, how does that influence the appeal of our industry to, you know, male versus female? So, you know, the reason I ask is if we, if we think about an industry of 3.1 billion global players, we know that well over half of that is going to be on mobile. So is there, a, by players, is there, a, is, is there a gender metric that we would use that could therefore influence the, comp the company and people who want to get into careers in the industry? Again, I don't know the answer, I'm just mm. asking the question. And, and th this, this thought came to me when I was chatting earlier this week, um, and I hope I don't say anything wrong here, um, to a friend of mine who's uh, CEO of Star Stable, you know, their, their, their gender balance is, you know, they have more, more women than men. You know, now, is that, this is where I'm going to run into the danger, that more women like horses than men. I don't know, is it, is it a sport that is, you know, pop populated? It, it, I don't know if that's the gender thing. I have no idea. So I think my, my, my question would be, do we think that content and the fact that there is going to be a gender balance across Call of Duty FIFA versus Candy Crush... But I think we Does have to be impact? careful that diversity is not just gender. Yeah. I'm a 53-year-old mm -hmm. woman. I won't play the same games as a 15-year-old girl. We play different content. Mm -hmm. Is the content available for me that's different or comes with the things that I like? I like Married at First Sight, if they made a game. But I also like Disco Elysium. I like lots of things, but they need to be tailored to different people because you can't just have the same people making the same games. And I want to jump on one thing, because you ask, how do you make this happen? So this is not an advert for the company or for myself. Uh, well, you, act, you should absolutely advertise your company. There's people watching at home who want a job. So uh, what, hiring, one of the things that you said, you know, we have value that we've been, we have set. And then, you know, we are uh, about 300 people. We have nine development studio, publishing investment. We have people all over the world. What we've done is, as the leaders, we have empowered the company to tell us what we need to do. So we just launched a diversity committee. All the companies are part of the group. They have representative to that. And it's their job, using our values that we build together, to actually tell the leadership team what diversity, inclusiveness, and sustainability means. I'm getting older. I'm not young anymore. And I don't leave the experience that maybe my kid here in the front row uh, <laughs> is living today. And we sometimes we are we have an unconscious bias. We don't live and breathe, you know, some of the topics. But in my company of 300 people, I have plenty of people that can tell to the leadership team, this is what we need to do. We know something that you don't know or you don't understand, but we can help you. So I think as the leaders, you kind of empower the people and give the people the direction. Say, look. We believe in this. Tell us how we can solve it. Because when we talk about building company that you recommend to your friends,
but it's no ago recommending to my friends to come and work here. It's all the employees, they're part of the committees across the entire studio, and then they come through the, you know, the, the committee that comes to the leadership team with all the ideas aggregated. They are the people that need to go out there and be confident that the company we're building is the company that their diverse friends or people with different background would enjoy. Um, empower your people to tell you that you're wrong and then what the direction is. I like that, ending on empowerment. Any questions from the floor? I think you see in hand, got a hand. Would you mind going to the mic for me? Thank you so much. Hello. Um, how, if there was a developer who's considering, you know, going completely solo on Steam or Oculus or whatever, how would you convince them to go to a publisher like yourself and to play devil's advocate, how would you say to a developer who might actually be with a developer that they might be better off on their own. Sorry, this is not about diversity, but that You're was fine. the question I had yeah, before. Yeah. My question to you is, what, what's your motivation? What's success look like for you? What are you trying to achieve? Do you, do you want loads of money? Do you want to finish the game? Do you want to finish the game with great mental health? Do you want everyone to know about your game? What, which of those things do you want? Because that's going to lead you to the answer. The person who wants to go to the publisher. Go on, I go. So. Okay, I want to jump on it because that was my talk at GDC. <laughs> uh, it was actually uh, define what you want to achieve, who you are as a person, what your dreams, your goals, your values. If, if you want to work with someone, decide that your values are the same as their company values. And it, it was a long talk, but also, do you need a publisher? Now, you have two companies here that we do publishing, but we are not just a publisher. And, and the argument is like, do you need a publisher? What do you really need? You need money. Publishers are not the only source of money. You need support. You might find better options somewhere else. Maybe the publisher is the answer, but first define what you need, who you are, what you need. Not, and even if it's money, it doesn't need to be a publisher. And then speak to people in the industry, watch my talk if you want, I can send you my deck. You might not need a publisher. Uh, that's the first step. First understand who you are and what you need before you say, oh, how do you convince me to go to a publisher? I might actually want to convince you that you don't want a publisher. This is great. John? Want me to answer? You've probably got more than you asked for. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll take more. <laughs> we, I mean, we, we, we've, um, we launched a new website in November, and from then until I think last month we had 600 game pitches via our, via our website. We run a survey, we run a constant survey, asking people what they're looking for. So I already know, I know I go, told you, so I, I already know. 94%, um, number one, people want marketing, PR, and community management. So I think, how does that define us as a publisher when we're selling ourselves to people? Well, if I'm selling myself to investors, there are two things that we, we want to be as a publisher. One is we want to be able to assemble a strong portfolio, IP portfolio, speak to developers, and become the publisher of choice for those developers, whatever their requirements are. And the second thing we need to be is we need to be good at distributing the content, at selling it and marketing it, because that is the number one thing that we've found from our, from our, our survey, what, what developers want. So that's, for us, more often than not, that's what it comes down to, is conversations. Funding, by the way, was second, with about 86% of people wanted funding. So, you know, a lot of it comes down to the conversations with how we can reach audiences. And every, anybody can publish um, a game on Steam, and quite literally everybody does, because there are now 70,000 games on Steam, and I think 11,000 launched last year. So what, what, you know, what we talk about really is that discovery process. And you can absolutely publish by yourself, but how do you want to publish, and is it about reaching a market, and do, and do we have some of the components that could maybe help you reach a broader audience than you could do without us? So. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. Any more for any more? Go on then, sir. Would you mind going to the mic, please? Thank you. And that'll be that last one. We'll wrap up. I think you've got to you've we'll got to run. Train to go. Hey there. Um, yeah, I thought it's uh, really interesting that the um, idea of age <coughs> came up quite quite late in the conversation about diversity. Um, just what are your thoughts on an industry that often seems to treat itself as though it's very young. You know, if you hear in the news, games, there's always this sense, oh, it's kids, kids, games, Fortnite. But obviously, 
uh, I'm old, and I've sort of like watched and been part of the games industry, but do you think we do enough um, in terms of who we talk to to recruit for ourselves, but also actually in the people we address with the products we make? Do we think we're doing enough for an industry that isn't a kid's industry? This is as broad as it gets now. I'm not going to point at one of them and ask them to answer on age. They can speak for themselves. Um, there's been an interesting piece of research done by the Mental Health Foundation, sponsored by Jingle Jam, that looked at uh, games and well-being, but they also looked at the stigmatism of playing games when you're older, and I think a lot of that comes from media coverage, but people were hiding that they were game players mm. because it was embarrassing. It wasn't socially acceptable to play games. And I think not only do we need to create games for older people, particularly shorter evening games that fit into a lifestyle, we need to crush this stigmatism around playing games is for kids, playing games is a waste of time. And it's throwaway constant in mass media constantly. I was watching kids TV yesterday with my son, and there was a thing on Storybots that said it was a brain saying, well, at least you're not wasting your time playing computer games. A throwaway comment based on nothing, like we're really damaging. And I think that's, that's the first narrative we need to change. I mean, I'm probably not younger than you. And, you know, over the next 20 years, I'm still going to be playing games, and I'm going to be proud to be saying I'm a gamer, right? But let's get out of our bubble of people that are in this room, right? Uh, my mom is nearly 70, and uh, she plays games. Does she call herself a gamer? No, that she plays as much games as I do, probably. So there is also the element that sometimes we're also in our own bubble. And, you know, gamers is an hardcore gamer that plays on Steam and has all the latest console. You know, John, you mentioned mobile. How many people are there playing way more games than we do, more hours a week? They don't think they are gamers. That's something. So there is also the element. Uh, but, yeah, the stigma in the media is, is still there. Uh, you know, gaming is for kids, or, you know, gaming is a bad form of entertainment, watch some TV instead, or do that, something else. Like, but I think we are also guilty sometimes, because I'm a gamer because I play on Steam and all the cons. I was like, well, my mom actually is a gamer. She doesn't call herself a gamer, but she plays more than me. To me, it's education and evolution. I, I, so I joined the industry 25 years ago, and I was the only one of my friends who played games. I met loads of people when I joined the games industry who shared the same interests as me. I still have the same friends. None of them play games. Right, so that's evolution. But my, my son, I think 100% of his friends play games. My daughter, probably 100% of her friends play games. So that's, that's, I think that's an evolution thing for me. Um, I can't convince any of my friends from 25 years ago to start playing games. They get educated in the positivity of the games industry, not necessarily through what they read, but the behavior of their kids. Okay, that influences them, and all of a sudden, they look at my job in a different way. So that probably sounds like a bit of a cop-out as an answer, because unless you've got people in the media who are interested in games, how are you going to convince them to be interested in games? So it's more about you know, the narrative of being pragmatic about the industry, of how successful it is, and the figures that go out, and the scale of it compared to the movie industry and other entertainment industries, and it's getting people to sort of stand back and listen. And I think, you know, the last two years have really um, increased the profile of the industry, and I think people have, have seen the positivities of games. You know, when, when we... When we I've referenced my, my, my son again, as, a, you know, parents of regularly do, um, you know, the person who was least impacted when we, 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 we were self-isolating or, or isolating at home um, was my son because he was staying in touch with his friends in exactly the same way as he had been for the last six years. The only thing that had changed is he couldn't go out and play football as much, but that was okay because he spent more time talking to his friends. You know, so, so I think it's, there's an evolution thing in there as well. Yeah. I'm reminded of, um, and I, I, I'm going to end with this quote, because I think it's a really nice way to finish this. That question's brilliant. Um, you don't ask someone, do you watch movies or do you listen to music? You just ask what kind they like. One day, we'll simply ask each other, what kind of games do you play? This day now seems closer than ever. It's one of my favorite quotes about gaming. It's Genova Chen, and it's so on point. And I am heartened when I read that quote, and I've been heartened by the, the things and the words and the insights I've heard on stage today. So can I have a round of applause for the panel?